Hi, I'm Jessica from Tudor Time Machine. Before we start the next episode, I wanted to let you know that we're offering our very first line of Tudor Time Machine merch. So these six items are only available until November 30th. Then they're history. See what I did there? Go to our Facebook page and hit the Shop Now button to see our Tudorific designs, the best pod swag out there. This inaugural offering is 10% off. So don't miss these items that declare your interest and your style. And enjoy this episode of the Tudor Time Machine podcast. Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 34 of our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're new here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and it goes in order. You know, one of the best things about doing this podcast is having listeners from everywhere. I mean, when when I see where our listeners are coming from, it's it's really exciting. So many different countries. Yes, and if you're enjoying it, support us by buying some Tudor Time Machine swag. Yes, please do. Go to the shop button on our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page and get your Do You Tudor tea. In our last episode, we saw Rutland and George Wyatt almost come to blows. Now we're going back to Philomena and Constance to see what is in the inventory of Wyatt's possessions. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jessie. Chapter 34, The Arundel Inn, in which Constance and Philomena study Wyatt's possessions, but learn by his debts. Examined scrolls teetered at Philomena's feet. Looping up another parchment on her lap, she dropped it on top, knowing she should retrieve another, but her mind was numb from the search. This room was for dry goods, and the barrels and boxes, she usually despised counting, seemed strangely alluring in comparison to these endless, endless rolls. Constance pressed on through another list of Wyatt's possessions. Three viols, a case of flutes tipped with silver, three lutes in a case of leather— Philomena held up her hand. In the instruments? Wyatt was a fine musician. He may have had them with him always. I do not think so, but let us keep it in our minds. Weapons? Constance continued. The tusk of a sea boar, a demi-lance staff, a two-headed sword with gilt-hilt pommel cut with the Wyatt crest, the scabbard black velvet lined, four single daggers laid with bonework and leather cases, a stone of red marble, a looking-glass set in ebony. Constance took a breath. Privy accoutrement, four close-stools of black velvet garnished with lace and fringe of gold, a silver silk fringe with pan, four close-stools in fashion of chairs with green cloth, a close-stool of red satin embroidered with gold with a pan. My, my, Philomena, these Wyatts certainly had a fancy for luxury. Indeed, said Philomena. What thrones! I had never considered such items, but I must. The men would be my slaves. They would come to my inn just to shit. Perhaps Sir Thomas sewed the relic in one of the close stools and protected it with his bottom. Oh, Jesu, I am weary of this. Constance groaned. Salt has come next. Do you think it could be in something kept in the kitchen? My head is aching. How long will I be poisoned by your malmsey wine, Philomena? You do the salters, I will do the portraits. We should return these rolls to Westminster before nightfall. Taking the parchment, Philomena said, Item, a holy man's ring in the sugar, before turning a serious face to the task. The words confronted Constance like a tedious Greek lesson. It boggled the mind to imagine the poor soul who had compiled this odious inventory. She read, Picture of King Henry in armor with a gilt frame and a curtain of satin. Picture of the baker's daughter with curtain. Picture of Alexander the Great riding on an elephant with a curtain of satin. Picture of King Edward holding an astrolabe. Gilt frame and a curtain of satin. Picture of Lady Margaret Lee holding a book with a curtain. Picture of Sir Thomas Cromwell out of frame. No curtain. Picture of two young ladies, one with a pearl brooch, one with a red spaniel with a curtain. Two great pictures of Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder in whole proportion. One in armor, the other donned in black satin with a pomander. Constance considered a pomander, an orb-like jewel with compartments to hold sweet-smelling spices, compartments in which a ring could easily be hidden away. Philomena! 
just a moment i am reading about how many spoons the wyatts had and i cannot tear myself away i am so sad to interrupt you but do you recall what the letter said about the poet keeping the relic close this inventory lists that he was painted wearing a pomanda in the painting at george wyatt's he also wore a pomanda that speaks where tongues do not you believe the relic to be held in a pomanda it seems the most likely place we have encountered so far Falk tap tapped on the door mistress i have a note from the earl of rutland taking it unceremoniously philomena perused it master george has complained to lady mildred cecil about the missing inventory rutland is suspected alas poor noble i warrant it is not the first time mistress fogg said my lord's cart awaits oh fie on it rutland must truly be in trouble constance worried we must return these rolls post haste rutland will be none the worse for helping us i will pay his servant for closed lips and pay that poxy clerk at westminster to announce the scrolls were miraculously found Falk, take some coins to unruffle feathers. Tell Rutland's servant his cargo will be down in moments. Constance, what would you have me do? Look for mention of the pomanda. As you will. Constance tore through the next roll, beds and furniture, then bundled parchments tucked away inside a larger roll tumbled into her hand. Receipts? No, from tradesmen. She read, Upon the death of your father, Thomas Wyatt the Elder, I have wrought in gold plate, the memorial with many words the following is the amount owed for the service named creditors a beastly lot every one briefly lamented the untimely death of the great man yet boldly detailing payment due her heart went out to wyatt's family what a pile the poet left to be paid notes for a fur travelling cloak a new set of fine linen for digging the grave for the apothecary for the preparation of the body for burial then an arresting account Money's to be paid for Master Hubert Moray, for a jewelled necklace in the shape of a W, earrings of pearl, a ring with a ruby, and one pomander of gold, and a golden falcon holding a chain. Philomena, mention of the pomander, here, with the poet's debts. Let me see, Philomena studied the paper. By heaven, this may turn out to be to our advantage. If the pomander were listed on the accursed inventory, it would be under lock and key at court, or sold off to whoever knows who but as it is we may inquire of master hubert moray he will be registered at goldsmith's hall constance said perhaps the debt was not paid and the goldsmith reclaimed it a debt will drop you in hell philomena said so i believe it paid yet with a little breeze in our sails we may make a discovery the hodgepodge of men carrying wares to be appraised by the agents of the worshipful company of goldsmiths and silversmiths parted before the retinue of constance and philomena as fine ladies inside the hall a young man with a left dimple and a smart gaze embarrassed constance he invited herself and philomena to warm their hands by the furnace constance was intrigued by the devices and watched as he weighed an item and made a note the instruments are beautiful she observed seeing the great pride the lad took in his scales and crucible he lifted the branding iron to show her the stamps mistress the lion is the symbol of our city and this this shows the purity of the metal she wondered if this good-natured boy was sly if he took an angel to add to the purity to the metal he tested she used her voice of authority sirrah i need to know the history of master hubert moray the jewellery maker lady that is a frenchified name we are englishmen here you have my oath on it but the boy as requested called his master and soon the question was posed again to the wiry old bit of a man moray jeweller to his grace king henry himself the master goldsmith mused i set one of his most precious rubies for now which of his queens was it was it uh, a seymour or the next one from the low country or one of the catherines i cannot remember indeed i cannot but it was a stethos that deserved such an ornament a ruby with a setting of twining gold wire with the whimsy of a bird-cage the lady's face i cannot recall yet the clavicle by god two alabaster steps with the hollow between how the jewel rested there atop a pillow of gleaming cutis sir 
Constance hesitated to interrupt this singular description. I beg, can you tell, did you make a pomander for Master Moray? A pomander, an ungainly thing with the intricacy of a tennis ball. Rings, pendants, buckles, that is fine work. Pomanders, bleh! A man looks a fool with one of those things banging on his pectus, like a church bell, or slung on a girdle getting tangled in the limbs. No, no. I am a delicate workman. One of the best for small precious goods, am I. I have always felt pomanders were lacking in subtlety, and now I am happy to have a man of your knowledge voice my sentiment, Philomena said. Yet my friend has a commission from her mistress, who saw a likeness of a pomander made by Master Moray, and will not be content until she has the jewel. Master Moray has been dead some time. Tell the lady a nice pendant would suit better. A scented handkerchief serves as well to soften a rotten smell, and is more dainty than a thing like a piss-pot. Philomena waded through a few more exchanges with the pomander hater, drawing the old man out until he begrudgingly named John Wall, once an apprentice to Hubert Moray, now with his own goldsmith's shop in Westcheap. Westcheap housed a bewildering array of smitheries with massive signs jutting halfway across the street, a mad hodgepodge of metal cats, grapes, gods, and insects. The tower lifted Constance over the rubble of a shop toppled by an oversized wrought-iron goldfish that had once hung as a sign to mark it. The weight and angle of the heavy thing must have tortured the poor building's supports until they gave way, leaving the fish poking out of the debris with a blank expression. "'Do watch your head, Constance,' said Philomena as another sign, this one in the shape of a raven, loomed over them. "'Dear, dear, Philomena, your inn is barely marked at all. "'You are fortunate that your patrons find you.' "'It is a war here,' observed Philomena, "'to create a beacon that will draw men in. "'But it is entirely wild. "'These signs hang too low. "'I feel I am dodging hammers. "'Ah, here is Master Wall's establishment.' "'A monstrous cricket crouched over the door. "'Constance studied the huge thing. "'It was dubious. "'She felt rushing into the shop was the safest course of action.' She pulled Philomena with her. The door would not open, locked for safety from the inside, of course. Philomena knocked, and they waited to be ushered in. The proprietor was a city fop. Red hair and white ruff pulled just above his doublet, showing command of the current style. "'What do you ladies lack?' he asked with polite indifference, not pushing his wares as a street hawker would, but hanging back, awaiting their interest. "'I seek something most unusual.' Philomena began. My mistress saw a portrait of Sir Thomas Wyatt, the poet. In this portrait he wore a pomander, a most beautiful pomander, made, I believe, in the shop of Master Hubert Moray himself. I have heard far and wide that you, Master Wall, were apprenticed to the great Frenchman. Is that not true? Do you know of this commission for Sir Thomas? Warmed by flattery, Master Wall answered, It is true. I was Moray's apprentice. And that pomander was my work. It is one of the oddest and most beautiful things I have made. Constance glanced at Philomena as if to say, See our cleverness. Have you heard the whereabouts of it? Philomena asked. Our mistress seeks to acquire it for herself. Such a thing. Master Holbein himself designed it. John Wall earnestly replied. The work was so fine, so perfect. It was all Sir Thomas had desired, he told me when he came to collect it from the shop. The way he smoothed the falcon's head made me proud. He loved it. It must be exquisite. Philomena heaved a heartfelt sigh to encourage further talk. The sketch itself is a work of beauty, and I made it as Master Holbein drew it. Wait here. I have the sketch and can make the exact likeness for your mistress. John Wall left, and the workers stood idle, barely keeping the fire ablaze. Of course ladies would not like sweating figures to be pounding and hammering as they considered what jewel should adorn a dainty neck or finger. Yet it was awkward, Constance felt, waiting there, surrounded by the non-speaking, perspiring smiths. John Wall returned with a sketch that was everything promised, a delicate bird atop an exquisite orb. In the picture, the animal's eyes seemed full of sorrow. I cannot boast to have wrought the fowl as perfectly as Master Holbein designed it, John Wall said. 
Yet it was good work. Sir Thomas desired for the compartment to be of a piece. You see it drawn. But of course, for your lady mistress, the pomander can be made in the usual way, with separate compartments. And Sir Thomas required a tiny lock be made, here, in this picture. Again, that can be omitted in the copy. Constance studied the drawing. A lock for a tiny key, the size of the one Joan Whitnell had taken from Thomas the Younger's ear. Master War, she said. My lady, the Princess Cecilia, so had her heart set on the very pomander that is in the portrait. Could you be persuaded, sir, to help us discover the original? The Swedish princess? Hmm, well, her grace should have what she desires, of course. I consider the jewel one of my finest works, but I, I have no time for searches. No time at all, I regret. Thank you, and good day. Oh, Ben, open the door for these ladies. Jesu, playing on the princess's name will not help us with merchants. Her credit is low, Philomena observed, as the door to the jewelry shop closed behind her. Sir Thomas held the relic in that pomander, Constance said. Why else change the interior? And the drawing of the key, it must be like this one. She drew the key from the chain around her neck. Why would the sun have the key and not the jewel itself? Yet if the sun did have the pomander, a thing of such value would have been on the inventory. Oh, what a muddle. Do you think the poet had the jewel buried with him? Having it with him in the grave, that would be fitting for a man of such feeling. Perhaps, but his friends would never bait grave-robbing vultures with something so fine, Philomena reasoned. Someone has it. I am sure of it. Constance tried to imagine the poor poet Wyatt, how he had died, falling from his horse, skewered in a fight, or was he one of those pitiful souls who just dropped dead as he walked along, knowing the circumstances of his death might yield something? Philomena was correct. The falcon-headed pomander would not have been buried away for looters to unearth, which was fortunate, she thought. She might have lost her eyebrows to gunpowder, blasting open the great poet's tomb. Constance and Philomena hope that the relic is held in this pomander that Sir Thomas Wyatt had himself painted with. Right, because he had himself painted with it. It must be important. Right. right? And he's had himself drawn with it. He had himself painted with it. And we were inspired in this pomander plot point by a number of 15th and 16th century portraits we saw of men and women depicted with their favorite pomanders. Who knew pomanders were something to have yourself painted with? But painters from all over Europe, you know, featured these jeweled pomanders in the hands or, or shining on the chests of their aristocratic sitters. So these pomanders must have been important to people. Yes, Elizabeth I is often shown wearing one in portraits. And they were fashionable, costly, and useful. Who would not want a pomander? And the word pomander is from the French, meaning apple of amber. And I wonder about that, because why amber? Why apple of amber? Because amber is a gem, and it has, it has absolutely no scent. So since pomanders are so much about scent, why would you call it an apple of amber? Why not like an apple of yummy smell. <laughs> Le pomme de yummy smell. <laughs> and actually, amber is not a gem, but it's hardened tree resin. Oh, because you're like a tree resin expert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there you go. But still, the hardened tree resin also has no scent. So maybe it's because sometimes the pomanders were made of resin? Okay, well, that could be. So because the word pomander refers to both the perfumed material, and also the container it's held in. The thing about pomanders is that since the beginning of recorded history, humans have been trying to cover bad smells. Oh, yes. From burning herbs to smothering the body in perfumes. And the pomander allowed a practice of carrying good air. And that really came into popularity in Europe during the Black Death in the Middle Ages. This had a health care element to it because the prevailing idea of medicine in Europe before the Black Death was this idea of humors, which was favored by the Greek physician Hippocrates and promoted by another Greek physician, 
Galen, and we've talked about Galen in other episodes, because he was incredibly important to Western history. He lived and worked in the Roman Empire, and he had a huge influence on Western medicine. For better or worse. Yeah, but I mean, some people must have gotten better under his advice, or in spite of it anyway, because his influence lasted for over a thousand years. A thousand years of not really helping people that much. I know. It's, if only Galen had <laughs> had a slightly more scientific approach. So his idea of humorism or this idea of humorism is not funny. It's not funny. But it's the idea that the body is made up of humors. Yes. And those humors are blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. Mm. And these humors have different qualities, and all of them need to be in balance for you to be a healthy person. In Western history, we have a thousand years of people trying to balance their yellow and black bile. Yes. Can you imagine <laughs> all the regimes that were advised? Get more phlegm in your diet. Feel great black bile cleanse. Well, I mean, then is now. Keto, paleo, Mediterranean diet, low fat, full fat, black bile, yellow bile, and some phlegm. Must, mustn't forget your phlegm. But to the population of Europe in the Middle Ages, an imbalance of humors could explain any individual person getting sick. But when the plague hit in the 14th century and hundreds of thousands of people got sick at the same time, Doctors reconsidered. They thought there must be some contagion from the outside. It couldn't be that everyone's humors just went wacko simultaneously. Right. This contagion from the outside, of course, could be God's wrath. And in Europe, you know, the scapegoating of Jewish people, lepers, witches, the usual suspects in Western Europe. But there was also this new concept, which was miasma. And this is the idea that bits of rotting matter, miasmata, waft through the air as a poisonous vapor or this kind of mist. And that's what sickens people. So again, it's from the outside, not from the inside. This idea of miasma, it's an excellent seed to the idea that there are germs. And it's a good movement from the theory of the humors because it did connect living conditions and illness. Because it led to the practice of removing rotting bodies. Excellent. Always a good thing. Excellent. <laughs> Bring out your dead, please. <laughs> and at least trying to improve sanitation. But it stopped short of encouraging people to wash their hands after contact with a sick person. And, you know, obviously that was a real problem. But to be fair, Hand washing as a technique to curtail the spread of infection wasn't really identified Either. until 1849, and it wasn't fully adopted in the U.S. at least for another hundred years. No. So I think we can forgive the tutor that they didn't make that connection. Yes. Yeah. No. It's pretty incredible when you think that we have only been in seriously been encouraged to wash our hands since the 1980s. Yeah, it's no, crazy. It's crazy. In the Tudor period, the focus was so much on bad air. You were supposed to be able to detect this miasma only through smell. And as long as you got rid of the smell, you got rid of the poison. Protect yourself from the foul odor. Protect yourself from dangerous illness, which, of course, fell did short. not work. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> fell short. I hate to think about all the medical practices we really cling to today that will be determined did not work in the future. I guess that's the way science goes. It's inevitable. Anyway, in the Tudor period, this foul air obsession gave rise to the pomander being a health care essential. The richer you were, the more elaborate and expensive your pomander, of course, because you want your health care essential to reflect your buying power. So then both, is now. Then is now. So both the scented ball itself, there were different prices for that, and of course for the case. One of the simplest forms of a pomander was an orange or an apple stuck with cloves. Now to us that sounds pretty cheap, right? But then that at this time was out of many people's price range. Oranges were imported and herbs were used, but the most pungent and therefore the most effective pomanders 
used spices and lots of them. And as we've discussed in other episodes, these imported spices were fabulously pricey. And they came from Asia and India, and the routes traced by spice merchants were treacherous. And all of this was reflected in the cost to the person who was buying them. So spices added taste to food, but they were also used as a basis for medical treatments, and in that they were invaluable. So having the luxury to use precious spices in a pomander to make a nice smell, it was only for the very well-off. And amongst the upper classes, these pomanders, they were the thing. And there were lots of recipes for pomanders, too. And I'm sure they all touted different health benefits. Oh, sure. I mean, this recipe against the plague miasma, you know, this one against the headache miasma, this one for the runny nose miasma. None of it really worked, but then there is a psychosomatic element in health. Maybe if you thought you were not going to get a headache because of saffron up your nose, you didn't. These pomanders were not going to ward off the plague because the plague was the plague. There was nothing psychosomatic yes. about the plague. I mean, maybe if you had an ache, it yeah. would work. But if you had the plague, no. No. So it was a fragrant ball, and it was made some kind of pliable resin. They would soften it, and then they would pound it, and then they would infuse it with the scent. First, some type of musk, and then they would add cinnamon, rose water, mace, cloves, lavender, nutmeg, rosemary, all kinds of spices and herbs. And after they scented the resin, they would roll it up into a ball and voila, you could ward off your apple of amber. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Maybe resin, of course, now I understand why it's called <laughs> a, a apple of amber. The most basic cases were made of cloth, kind of like a bag. That was the cheapest kind, but even again, as we said, having material to spare for a bag would have been a luxury. Um, then the next most expensive were made of wood, and then for the super rich, they were made of silver or gold. Often they were also ball-shaped, but there were many other kinds, and we see them in portraits. That's how we know about them, and in those portraits, they have pomanders that are made as skulls, as books, as nuts, as fruit. I mean, yeah, they were made in every shape that somebody could think of. They made them a custom, your custom made pomander could be anything you wanted. And they were different sizes too. So sometimes they'd be worn, you know, strung on a ribbon or a chain and you'd wear it around your neck. In our portrait of Thomas Wyatt, he's wearing his around his neck, or they could be suspended from a girdle. Not a suck-in-your-gut girdle. Not no. a spanksy girdle. No, not a spanksy girdle. In the 16th century, a girdle was like a thin belt around your waist, and really tiny pomanders could be but worn as a ring. That, that wouldn't hold much scent to ward off illness, but I guess... It Maybe was nice. if you held that <laughs> right up to your nose. Yeah, you had something really pungent in there. But, you know, I think a pomander must have made a great gift. Like, and we still do that, right? All these scented candles and bubble bath and soap. You know, you give to somebody who you sort of know, but you might not really know that well for, you know, birthday or holidays. It's kind of the standard, you know, Christmas gift for someone you don't know that well. Sort of personal, therapeutic, thoughtful, and yet... A little generic. Yeah, a little generic. And you can, you know, buy it in the museum store. Yeah, a no-fail gift for the queen who has everything. But... Because you can never have too many <laughs> pomanders. <laughs> but if you were going to give it to Elizabeth, it would have to be an extremely expensive one. Well, I saw an image of a pomander from 1600 that still survives today. It's made out of gold in the shape of a boat with these beautiful sails. And it's inlaid with emeralds. I think that would have done for Queen Elizabeth. Oh, it sounds spectacular. And, you know, in one of the portraits, the queen is holding a pomander made of silver with pearls. It's in the shape of an ornate jar, and the pearls are just dripping mm. off it. And I bet that pomander was a gift because Elizabeth did not like to spend. Maybe it was from Sir Robert Dudley himself. Maybe so, because how considerate. It's ornamental, and it keeps her healthy. Right, exactly. 
As we said earlier, there are many portraits from this period of women and men with pomanders, and often the sitter is drawing attention to it. They're sort of holding it up. They're like, featuring it. Almost. Look, see, yeah. Yeah. I have a pomander. And I don't really know what that iconography is. Well, maybe it's sort of a symbol of health. You know, the way we like to take pictures of ourselves in running gear or, you know, it makes us look like we're taking care of ourselves. Hmm. You know, you're keeping the air around you clean with your pomander. You, <laughs> well, you're someone may, with self-respect. Yes, but we could go the other way. Maybe it's a symbol of mortality, mm -hmm, reminding you that you could get sick at any time. A memento mori. That's very true because things we associate with, you know, beauty, like flowers and candles and fruit, hourglasses, clocks, those were all symbols of death in this period. So why not a pomander? You're right. Something to remind you of your health. Especially when it's made in the shape of a skull, as they often were. Right. So in our story, Sir Thomas Wyatt's pomander obviously has significance to him, as its shape shows. And we decided in our story that he had this precious object specially designed for him by Hans Holbein. We have talked about Holbein in other episodes. Most Tudor files know his wonderful portraits, but he was also an incredible draftsman. He designed furniture, he designed sets for plays and masks, plates and silverware, architectural decorations, books, covers, boxes, and yes, jewelry. He was an all-round artist and designer. Yeah, and historians think that many of the fantastic jewels worn by Henry in these iconic portraits by Holbein were actually jewels that the artist designed himself. So he was featuring both Henry and also doing a little advertising <laughs> yes. for his wonderful jewelry designs. <laughs> also, he designed the pendant in the famous portrait he did of Queen Jane Seymour. Right, that, and that's a gorgeous pendant. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Holbein did not design the Anne Boleyn B. I know everyone loves that necklace, but it is pretty basic. Holbein went in for much more elaborate work. Just because he undoubtedly did not make that B, it's not to say that he did not make things for Anne, because Anne was his patron. He, she was the reason he came back to England in 1532 to become a court artist. She was the one that saw his talent and, and insisted on him coming back to court. And it's incredible that given that, we don't have any existing portraits that he made of her. Unquestionably, he drew and painted her numerous times and also created jewelry for her and all kinds of things. But nothing reminiscent of her survived Henry's purge. It's a crime. He just got rid of everything. It's really terrible to think of all the treasures that must have been lost and how wonderful it would be to have a real likeness of her. So in the British Museum, there's a book that belonged to Henry VIII called, interestingly enough, The Jewelry Book. Mm -hmm. And it's just pages and pages of Holbein's designs. And some of those things might have been designed for Anne, but because her name is not on them, Henry did not rip them up. But we don't know. Right, so he didn't rip up the drawings because it wasn't like an A and a B. Is right. that the thinking? Right, yeah. Because some of the jewelry and designs don't have initials. They're just different kinds of things. So maybe they were made for her. We look at the Anne story as sort of because we know the ending. But for people of the time, her downfall was so sudden. I imagine Holbein working on something for her. And then he had to quickly change the A, B to a J, S so Jane Seymour could wear it. That happened with all the furnishings at court. Yeah, I read about that. Like at Hampton yeah. Court, they all had to go around changing everything. Boom. Anne was out and workmen had to frantically run around replacing an entwined A and H with an entwined J and H. And I'm sure all the artists had to do it. It must have been such an extraordinary time for everybody and a really hard one for Holbein since Anne was his patron and just you know, changing allegiances in a flash. Anyway, the sketches in the jewelry book, they're just... They're just beautiful. I mean, the sketches are beautiful. So imagine what the finished objects must have looked like. There was a lot of work in the 1530s for jewelry makers because with the dissolution of the monasteries, Henry claimed all these religious objects that were made of precious metals and studded with jewels. No, I mean, we've said it before and we'll say it again. The Reformation divided England from the rest of Europe 
but it also brought in a ton of valuables for Henry to play with. He repurposed a lot of this Catholic church loot. He melted it down and had artists make wonderful jewelry for him <laughs> and occasionally and for, for one of his wives. <laughs> for one of his wives. And there were very few objects from the time that have survived because in turn, that jewelry was melted down and created again as something else. Now, of course, the idea of melting down a pendant designed by Hans Holbein, that just seems crazy. But people always want something new. No, it's true. I mean, you can just imagine, you know, sort of, oh my goodness, Lady Carrie, what's that hideous thing around your <laughs> neck? It's so 1530s. I know this fellow, Nicholas Hilliard. Let him remake it for you. He's such a talent, Ex such a modern thinker. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and let's show our... <laughs> Our story making. We were inspired to have Holbein design Wyatt's Pomander by a historical fact. There are two sketches by Holbein in the British Museum of metalwork he really did design for Sir Thomas Wyatt. One is a jewelry case with these intricate leaves and scrolls, and the other is a beautiful book cover with the initials TW entwined in the center. So we'll post them on Facebook and you can see just the kind of beautiful work he made. And we have those two drawings, but there's no reason to think that Thomas Wyatt didn't commission him to make other things as well. And we chose Hubert Moray to be the person who made Wyatt's Pomander because he was a real goldsmith, a real metal worker and a jewelry maker. He was French, and he was a friend of Holbein's, and he also worked for Henry VIII. And John Wall, our foppish fellow um, who runs the goldsmith's shop, was really an apprentice to Moray. And FYI, Nicholas Hilliard's goldsmith father, Richard, was an apprentice to John Wall. So we're kind of drawing on this fun <laughs> circle of, yes. of goldsmiths. And is it worth it to do extra hours of research to find the names of real obscure people to use in the fictional story? All you Tudor files know <laughs> that it is worth it. It is it's worth absolutely it. It's worth fun it. to geek out. Yeah. And I mean, for us, that's part of the fun of doing historical fiction, finding out how all these people were connected because they really were. All these goldsmiths were members of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, which was, and I think still is, the guild that oversees the regulation of precious metals. We know some of these goldsmiths' names because these incredible guilds kept lists yes. of their members, and they're fantastic resources. One of the most important duties of all the guilds was kind of slightly unpleasant because it was really to limit the workforce. Joining a guild was a long step-by-step -step process. A person could not work in their given field if they were not a member of their particular guild. And the guilds were also a way to control trade prices and for the xenophobic English to keep foreigners out of business. Mm -hmm. It was very hard to join a guild as a foreigner. And pretty much impossible as a woman. Of course. So the Company of Goldsmiths was established by Royal Charter all the way back in 1327. The location put it right in the center of the city in what is now the financial district in London. And the building that Constance and Philomena would have visited in 1565 was in fact built in 1407. They were still using that building in the 16th century. The London of 1565 would have still been a predominantly medieval city. I sometimes imagine the buildings the Tudors inhabited made of red brick, like Hampton Court and Hardwick Hall and Burley House. But those were state-of-the-art buildings in this time period. And only the very rich would have a new red brick house. Most of the buildings in the city, churches, businesses, guild halls, houses for regular citizens, they were already hundreds of years old by 1565, which is crazy. No, it's really hard to envision that now because almost all of those buildings are gone. There's so many fires. Yeah, and Goldsmiths Hall was rebuilt in 1634 because of a fire, and then it was built again in the 19th century because of another fire that happened. But the Guild Hall is still there doing its thing in the same spot for 700 years. No, it's pretty incredible. That's London for you. And just to show you how important this particular guild was, in 1515, so during Henry VIII's reign, the city aldermen made a list of the most powerful and influential guilds. 
And since then, the company of goldsmiths has been counted as one of the great 12 city livery companies. And these were the most influential guilds in London. We get the word hallmark from the fact that precious metals were checked and marked for purity in Goldsmiths Hall. I think about these great 12 city livery companies, sort of like the Forbes most important businesses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, they were just in this period, they were a force to be reckoned with. And in many ways, they had more power and money than the monarch did. Well, the monarchy borrowed money from the guilds and must have negotiated with the goldsmith's company a lot because they checked for purity of the coinage. And as we've talked about in other episodes, there were times when the crown, especially Henry VIII, wanted to debase the currency and it made the currency worthless. And of course, they would have to negotiate that with the guild. Right. I mean, Henry did debase the currency. It was actually called the Great Debasement. And that that debasement lasted through Edward's reign and Mary's reign. And finally, Elizabeth pulled all that bad coinage back and tried to restore some of the purity of the coinage, which was an unpopular move at the time because it made people's money somewhat worthless. But in the long run, it was a good thing for England. In the time of our story, in 1565, Trade and business is booming, though, and the financial area of the city is just growing. And in our story, the massive signs that completely freak Constance out really were a feature of the businesses of the city in the Tudor period. These signs would hang outside to attract customers. They weren't writing. They were symbols because obviously a lot of people at that time didn't read. And so these signs were usually made of metalwork or wood, and they were in the shape of animals or fruit or that kind of thing. So you could say, go to the sign of the grasshopper, especially if someone couldn't read. So the signage was kind of random at first. It wasn't as if the grasshopper meant anything in particular. It was just to catch the eye of the potential customer. Right. I mean, well, then is now. What does a gecko have to do with insurance or a tiger to do with cereal? Well, that's true. And there were certain symbols that came to be connected with certain businesses. For instance, Barclays Bank became associated with an eagle. Lloyd's Bank became associated with a black horse. So there, there were connections in the long run. Right. And those two uh, examples are still the same today. Yes. The metal signs in the Tudor period were dangerous, but apparently the situation got worse in the 18th century because in the Great Fire of London in the 1660s, the wooden and metal signs that existed in, in our chapter burned and melted. And so after that fire, King Charles had a great idea, and he gave businesses permission to make signs out of concrete. Yikes! <laughs> yep, so they got so heavy and ornate that they began to topple over. And after a few horrible accidents, the hanging concrete signs were banned. Obviously, that makes sense, and I'm sure people said, it's the end of the world because they're banning the concrete signs. And they started putting up these smaller, flat wooden signs. And they still have those wooden signs at pubs in London now. So that's why they have those wooden signs. Oh, that's interesting. Fortunately for Constance and Philomena, they got out of the city without anything <laughs> falling on them. <laughs> this time. This time. <laughs> but also without yes, the pomander. Without the pomander. They'll have to keep looking. So join us next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk. Well,